Okay. So we are very, very uh, honored and um, grateful that uh, today we're going to have uh, uh, Yesha, uh, Yadav, and Rod Garrett who are going to um, illuminate us with their wisdom on, on uh, digital currencies in particular. And so uh, Yesha is a professor of law at Vanderbilt University. And before that, she was a real person. She actually worked in a law firm yes. and, uh, in, in Paris and speaks perfect French. And also uh, was a legal counsel to the World Bank. Um, and uh, Rod also was half a real person because he was vice president of the Fed of New York and also has done some very inter interesting and important work on um, um, using the, these technologies for um, um, settlements with uh, the project Jasper in, in Canada. And he's, um, uh, he's, he's now become a professor. <laughs> this happens to <laughs> some of us. Professor of economics at uh, UCSB, and he has done some very important work on monetary economics in particular, and, and theory, economic theory in general. So this is fun fantastic. Thanks, thanks a lot for, for, to both of you for um, um, accepting to participate in this um, um, roundtable. So what I will do is I will first ask each of them one question that they will have five to ten minutes to answer. And then we will mo go to a more um, back and forth mode with uh, um, questions from the audience. So, Yesha, I would like to um, ask you, um, how, what are your views about the development of, uh, of digital, digital currencies? And because you specialize in uh, uh, financial securities regulation, from the regulatory point of view, what, do you see new risks associated with those currencies? Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, as a lawyer, I think it's my job to make everyone else look good. Um, so I'm truly delighted uh, to have this opportunity and to share um, to share the platform here with um, Rod and Bruno. Um, so I think this is a really interesting question. Um, and to maybe illustrate some of the risks, um, I'd like to um, take you guys to uh, the UK, uh, where another crazy thing happened um, a couple of weeks ago when the NatWest Bank suffered an outage. Uh, the NatWest is a massive bank in the, in, the, in the UK, and its online platform stopped working. Um, people could not access their online banking. Um, moreover, much more worryingly, uh, many of them saw some of the money disappear uh, from their account. So let me ask you guys, how many of you do online banking? How many of you do banking on your phone? That's easy, right? <laughs> it's pretty much everyone. How many of you have done banking, did online banking five years ago? How many of you did online banking 10 years ago? Right? It's a, it's a ever, that's amazing. Um, it's a slightly more dwindling number. But what we can see is that over the last 10 years, we have seen this massive structural shift from a bricks and mortar, highly localized, highly um, highly personalized banking system to one that is now increasingly digitized and automated over, uh, over telephones. Now let me ask you this other question. When these folks from the NatWest saw that their banking, uh, banking apps were not working, that in fact their money seemed to have disappeared, what do you think they did? They went to the branch. Yeah, right? So these guys did exactly what us as primordially rational human beings would do right in this moment which is run to the bank and try and get our money out right that is the rational reasonable thing to do even though as a collective we all know the problem that that creates for the banking system right so here we see an example which is an example that is happening all the time right um that is created by this transition from a bricks and mortar banking system to one that is digitized, but yet seems to suffer from similar kinds of risks that we've always seen. The run risks that we regulate the entire banking system for, right? The run risks that govern and is central to the entire architecture of banking regulation, capital regulation, liquidity regulation, uh, conduct of business regulation. The whole thing is centered around this run risk that is entirely essential uh, to the way in which banking regulation is structured. The question really becomes is, what will this run risk, what will the banking system look like in the next 10 years, right? As regulators or as people who think about the law and policy, especially here in Toulouse, in the Toulouse School of Economics, with its very unique approach to dealing with real world problems, 
the question is not what it looks like today, right? The question is what regulation needs to do for the risks that will exist in 10 years, 10 years time as banking evolves and as digital currencies become the norm um, within the marketplace. Now, one thing to think about is what will Iran look like in 10 years time when we have an entirely digitized uh, monetary system? Um, in that context, would we, will we be able to run to the branch in the event there's a problem, right? In a cashless economy, are we going to have the chance? Are we going to have an opportunity to be able to walk outside our door, to go to the, uh, to go to the Société Générale and to try and get our money out in a cash format? And if we do not, in fact, have that opportunity, then what will a run look like? In fact, will runs exist at all? And maybe, right, there's some reason for optimism on this context that maybe runs will become less frequent, right? Maybe in the context of banking in 10 years' time with a digital currency where entitlements are recorded in code, as Christine was discussing in the context of Bitcoin, perhaps the digital currency can encode the entitlement, the identity of the person to whom the money belongs in a more, um, in a more uh, obvious way, that perhaps we're able to store the data in a more distributed fashion, so it's not um, in the bank branch of the Société Générale in Toulouse, but you know, on a distributed ledger, that perhaps customers might feel more secure in the way that the banking system works. Maybe runs will become less. And if we cannot retire cash, then what does a run even look like? Right? Will the money move? Where will it go? At the same time, I think there's some new risks that exist in the context of a digital future 10 years from now and the changing nature of what the run architecture is going to, to, to look like. Even if uh, we're unable to get cash out of a branch because perhaps cash doesn't exist in the same way, then maybe we can transfer this cash or transfer our digital money to another bank. Right? Or perhaps transfer it into a payment system like a cryptocurrency that Christine was talking about. Right? In that context, perhaps institutions like SoftGen or BNP Paribas can still suffer some kind of liquidity crunch because customers are taking out their digital currencies and moving it into another institution or perhaps into a crypto system. More broadly, I think the biggest risk here is that of operational risk. Right? The fact that we're dealing with a digital currency landscape where currency is code, right? In that context, we are incredibly susceptible, systemically susceptible to a failure in code, right? How many of us, we all have our iPhones and our smartphones, right? How many of you had to, you know, update your iPhone recently or restart your iPhone because it was glitching, right? That is the norm. That is inevitable. That has to happen. Now, in the context of a currency that is code, how will the central bank deal with this kind of operational risk, right? When it comes to updating the software that is governing the currency, what will that look like? Under what circumstances will that code updating process and securing process be like? Apple sends us updates every couple of months to, you know, plug up these bugs and horrible things that our phones are susceptible to, hacking and so on. What will the central bank have to do to protect the monetary system, protect the code that is governing the monetary system? Now, a more kind of interesting question as we think about the present moment is what is the role of private industry here, right? And in particular, if uh, we're dealing in a digital marketplace, are banks enough to be able to spread the digital currency across our national financial systems? Now, if I tell you that 40% of the U.S. population today does not have a bank account, right? 40% of the U.S. population today does not have a bank account. But 200 out of 220 out of the 330 million people do, in fact, have a Facebook account, right? So the question becomes, do we need private enterprises like Amazon, or Facebook, or Google, or uh, WePay, Ali, you know, WeChat, and so on, that are highly networked, whose network is essentially the way in which they're connecting uh, their business to the average person. Do we need them more than banks to be able to play a role in uh. ensuring the velocity of the digital currency across the marketplace? And if so, what's the regulatory impact there, right? What is the regulatory impact? So thinking about the third part of this 
is the interaction and the interconnection between the central bank digital currency and the central bank needing to move that digital currency, the potential reducing role of banking, as well as the potential for us to have to increase our reliance on private companies with highly networked business models such as Facebook or WeChat or so on. In that context, how, we, how do we regulate that system? Right? How do we ensure that Facebook or Google or WeChat have the resources to be prudentially secure? How do we make sure that they have the resources to withstand a potential run risk if indeed their digital wallets that they supply to hold the digital currencies become unoperational or failure or have a failure in the software or some malware or some hacking? Right? So I think that there is some really interesting, very cool puzzles for us to think about, which go not, not just to the fact that our currency system is changing, but to the fact that our entire project of how we've envisioned the way in which money moves in the society potentially changing, right? And that creating new species of run risk, new kinds of operational risk when currencies code, and number three, requiring us to pay a lot more attention to non-bank financial companies whose expertise and experience in the financial marketplace is incredibly new, right? So I think those are just some of the opening thoughts to thinking about some of the system. Thank you very much. This is uh, very uh, thought-provoking. So you talked about the uh, central bank's interaction with the um, Facebook and BNP Paribas. So now we're going to have maybe the views from the central bank or about the central bank. And maybe I would like to ask Rod more precisely what do what you think, Rod, should be the role of the central bank uh, in this new environment of digital money and digital banking? And should central banks issue um, their own car digital currencies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. So it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, and so this is a question that, that a lot of central banks were, were grappling with. So thinking about this. Uh, the current money landscape and whether or not they should uh, play this new role in providing some form of currency in electronic form that's direct, directly accessible to the public. And in fact, it's, it's pretty important to make a distinction right off the bat that in terms of thinking about central bank uh, digital currencies, which, which is the term that people are commonly using, although most central bank money is digital, um, but most central bank money is only accessible to financial institutions. So we have to make this distinction between uh, what we might call a wholesale CBDC, uh, a central bank digital currency that would be used in retail, or sorry, in wholesale payment systems. Uh, Project Jasper that Bruno mentioned earlier, this was a, a, a proof of concept where we imagined uh, using a, a tokenized version of central bank money uh, in a closed system uh, that would allow banks to, to make payments to each other you know, on a distributed ledger system. Uh, and the retail type of concept where the central bank money was actually available to all. And that's not a new idea. Uh, Tobin, James Tobin back in, in, in the 80s uh, proposed something called deposit currency accounts, which would, which would have been a way for uh, individuals to have basically bank accounts at, at, at the central bank. So this concept isn't new. What's, what's really new uh, is that in principle, this could be done in, in new ways using new uh, for example, distributed ledger technologies. Although, uh, you know, central banks aren't most central banks aren't close to that uh, uh, using that technology just yet because of the fact that, you know, as as you know was alluded to, uh, you know, we can't have bugs and problems with with central bank money. So this, these technologies have to be tested before they can be used. So when we think about this at the retail level, that is, should the central bank provide some form of electronic currency to the public? Uh, I, one of my first thoughts on this was always sort of, well, why not? You know, I mean, if, if, if you had a million dollars in cash right now, you're forced to, uh, and, you know, you don't want to hold a million dollars in cash. You want to basically digitize it right now. You're forced to loan that money to a commercial bank. Uh, you know, in most countries, that's not such a big risk. The systems are sound, but why should you have to do that? Why can't you just take that $1 million in central bank liabilities and digitize them? Um, but then when I thought about it more deeply, uh, I come to the first way of the first line of thought, which is what's the mandate? So what is the mandate of central banks? Uh, and, and has that mandate changed? Have, have conditions in the economy or world changed such that that mandate should change? So, so speaking on the first topic, what's, what's the mandate? 
uh, my comments will be somewhat U.S. centric. I apologize for that. But but in the U.S., the central bank was founded in 1913. Uh, 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 in order to uh, provide soundness against financial panics. Uh, so essentially the lender of last resort function. So that was the, the main reason that the banks existed. The central bank was created. And central banks have been pretty successful. Or this, in, in the US, the central bank is pretty successful in performing that function. We've had major financial uh, crises, continental Illinois in 1984, the, the crash of 87, <laughs> um, the recent financial crisis where the central bank uh, played a supportive role and, and, and did, I think, a pretty reasonable job of, 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 of dealing with the crisis. So the central bank has performed well in that role, but over time, that role of the central bank has expanded. So central bank's role now includes uh, ensuring uh, found, the soundness of the banking system, but also uh, uh, other general economic goals of, of price stability and, and economic growth. And then further, those goals expanded into uh, goals with regards to maintaining uh, a well-functioning uh, payment system. Uh, in fact, the central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank issued a white paper in 1990 where it outlined these main responsibilities uh, in terms of safety, efficiency, and access. These are the three functions that the central bank uh, attempts to perform with regards to payments. And I should distinguish, there's a distinguish between payments and money. Uh, the, you know, the payment system is the system by which money is, is transferred and the central bank has responsibility with regards to both aspects. Um, but these goals of, of uh, safety, efficiency of access have been uh, performed, I think, uh, quite well by central banks. And the central banks can perform these roles in really two ways. They can be an operator, so they can take over and run a payment system. This is typically what they do with large value payments and also uh, retail payments, something like ACH. Uh, or they can be a supervisor slash regulator uh, of, of, of other systems. In fact, you know, most of the money in the United States is, and in most countries, is not central bank money, it's commercial bank money. It's money that's issued by uh, commercial banks uh, um, through the credit process. And so, so you know, they're, they're in that regard, they regulate and supervise the banks. So the central bank can play either a, a leading role or a supporting role. And so when we get back to this idea of central bank digital currency, should they issue one? What, what role should they play? Uh, so at this point, then I think, well, let's go back to thinking about the mandate. I think the overarching theme of what I've said about the central bank activity so far is that they're supporting the banking system. Uh, I mean, remember, banks came before commercial banks. <laughs> and so the central bank supports the banks. But one might ask whether or not in today's world, uh, even if we stick with that basic mandate, are the banks the, the right players? Are, the, are they the ones that the central banks should be supporting? So one of the things that's been happening a lot in the payment space is there's, in some sense, this decoupling of the functions of money. So economists often talk about the three functions of money, store value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. And a good money was something that had all three of these properties. In fact, when Bitcoin first came out, there were all these articles that said it's not money because it's it's not good at all three functions. There were these, there were these great blogs. Uh, uh, Krugman's blog was Bitcoin is evil. There was, there was another great blog, uh, 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 I'm forgetting the name, but, but the title was I want Bitcoin to die in a fire. And these were, these were people that were writing blogs that were basically arguing it's not good because it's not a good money in terms of all three functions. But things have changed and, and now people are decoupling these three functions. And if you think about what's happening in terms of a lot of initiatives, uh, um, what they're really doing is they're leaving the central, the unit of account store value aspect with, the, with, with fiat money, and they're trying to uh, capture the medium of exchange aspect and, and, and take over this aspect. And, 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 and they do this in a creative way. So if you think about things like Venmo in the United States or Alipay in, in China, what they're really doing, they're still transferring commercial bank money or central bank, it's backed by central bank money. Uh, but they're doing it on these new platforms, and more importantly, they're, these, these are highly integrated often with other aspects of these platforms. So if you think about the Libra proposal in particular, uh, this is a, you know, the Facebook platform. It's thinking of integrating all of your, your other social aspect, uh, aspects of your social life uh, in with your payments. Uh, and so this really changes, or should change, I think, the way we should think about payments. and, and uh, Brunemeyer, uh, uh, James, and Landau had this really nice paper 
where they talk about, uh, in some sense, the, the inversion of financial services. Uh, so in some sense, thinking about the idea that banks used to play a central role in payments and these were supported by, by other players and now there's this inversion where these other players are the key, are the key drivers of, of payment activities and the banks support them. Uh, and if we think in those terms, then 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 maybe the central bank, if if we stick with this idea that they, that they play a supportive role. And by the way, if if the central bank was to think about issuing a, a digital currency that is providing electronic currency to the public, that would require a change in the Bank Act. Uh, this is not within their existing mandate. So this would be a decision that uh, not only central banks would have to make, but governments would have to make. Um, but if the central bank uh, decided to stick with the supporting role, then I think the interesting question is who, who should they be supporting? Okay, and if you think about what's going on in China, uh, so in China, um, there's this uh, new uh, initiative where I think possibly within months, China will be issuing a digital currency. They call it digital currency electronic payments, which seems kind of redundant. It seems that the first two words and the second two words say, say the same thing. But uh, this, is a, this is an initiative whereby I think essentially they would provide uh, uh, the liquidity that's used in, say, Alipay. So instead of Alipay moving around commercial bank deposits, Alipay would move around uh, central bank deposits of, of the public. So, so there is certainly precedent, or there soon will be precedent, for this idea of central banks uh, playing a supportive role but changing the players whom they support. So I think that is, is maybe one of the most likely things. So getting back, though, to the idea of the central bank uh, being playing the primary role, one question I, I, I have then is that, you know, are we even able to do that? Like, are we just sort of kidding ourselves uh, that in this world the central bank could provide a currency that anybody would want to use? Uh, especially in this world where these things are so integrated with other aspects of social media and social platforms. And this isn't the central bank's strength. This isn't what they do. Uh, so I think if the central banks did try to provide some form of electronic cash, they would most likely not do it on their own. Uh, they would do it through, I think, commercial banks. So a very natural way that this would happen would be that you would uh, suddenly be able to have a savings account, a checking account, and a central bank account at the, the Royal Bank of Canada or, or at the Bank of America, as happens in the United States. Um, so these are the things that I think are possible. Lastly, I should say there are other aspects that one could consider. I mentioned the privacy aspect in my talk earlier. Um, that's 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 certainly that's certainly one thing. Um, but but broadly speaking, I think that uh, you know. Generally speaking, central banks have played a supportive role in the financial system, uh, and I think they can uh, continue to do that. Uh, offering central bank currency on, on their own is one solution, but they can facilitate uh, uh, private sector initiatives to offer something that's, that's almost equivalent. I think that that's, uh, might be a better way to go. Thank you. So, um, Yesha and Rod, you mentioned commercial banks, you mentioned central banks, you mentioned Facebook, you even mentioned Krugman who said Bitcoin was evil. I would like to say that maybe Facebook is even more evil than, uh, than, uh, than Bitcoin and, and possibly, um, I hope this will not be dangerous for me to say, maybe the central bank of China, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure. So, so th there was this dream uh, with, with um, uh, blockchain and Bitcoin that there would be some distributed um, um, ledger that would not be captured by a central authority. Um, it seems, what, what do you think about that? Do you think there is there's any hope of that or any chance or it's doomed? Well, it depends what kind of a distributed ledger you want to create, right? So um, the ledger comes essentially from this Bitcoin idea where you have um, different nodes being able to record the transactions, being able to um, do a few things, which is make sure that the transactions are verified in accordance to some set in accordance with a set formula to then um, after verification uh, put this uh, transaction on a ledger and what this does essentially the idea behind it is to reduce the need for a central intermediary so one of the questions earlier was what happens if you have an exchange you centralize the intermediation function the idea behind the distributed ledger when everyone across the different nodes is uh, verifying information automatically in accordance with certain codes, making sure it's correct and storing that information in a distributed fashion across these nodes, that that provides a more secure way of storing information and checking information. 
for this distributed ledger. That is the basic idea that uh, governs the way in which Bitcoin transactions are done and which people have been super excited about for a long time in the financial markets. So um, I am pretty pessimistic in some respects on certain very non-permissioned aspects of the blockchain, which is to say a completely central blockchain when there's no one standing behind the transactions to making sure that that blockchain works, right? And the problem with that in financial markets, a completely unpermissioned blockchain, is that in financial markets, we're used to having a central actor that stands behind processes, right? That makes sure that risk management is properly done, right? That makes sure, like in the case of a clearinghouse, that there's always someone standing behind a transaction to make sure that it uh, executes um, in a way that it's designed to do, right? As a way to provide finality and certainty within the financial system. So given the fact that this distributed ledger in a non-permission way does not or tries to do away with the central authority, many folks in financial markets are just not going to sign on to this, right? Because they want some guarantee that there's someone standing behind the trades. If indeed that trade fails, if uh, there's a problem recording the transaction, if there's a massive problem, that there'll be someone there to fix it. There's just too much at stake to have any other situation. Now, where are some folks in the industry are seeing some potential, though unrealized, is in the case of permissioned blockchains. Right, where people who are allowed to use these blockchains are those who are specifically authorized to do so, pre-authorized folks. So you are increasingly seeing in the case of certain banking, um, uh, banking conglomerates like JP Morgan or HSBC creating their own coins, right? HSBC coin, JPM coin, in which they're being able to transmit versions of um, basically able to settle internal payment obligations using a JPM coin or an HSBC coin um, through a permissioned blockchain within their own institution. At the same time, there's some problems with it. One is very small, right? It's a very small scale localized operation. Number two, it has latency, right? Which means that it's slower than what you get when you use a real time gross settlement payment system that a central bank provides, right? So it's slower. You need the systems to be able to go through and perform the checks and make sure it's all in accordance with uh, the proper parameters. So with that latency, the fact that it's still smaller, the fact that you still need to deal with and change legacy systems that we're used to, and perhaps most importantly, we need to see the payoff of this. And right now, the payoff is not all that clear. Why is it better to use a blockchain than use an RTGS system, right? And that payoff case has not necessarily been fully made. So a lot of the hope that was there in blockchain has slowly started to die. Um, the question is, you know, what's next? Is there some possible technological iteration that can reduce latency, maybe ha allow for greater interoperability and overcome legacy systems uh, sort of deficiencies? Maybe, but right now it's hard to see what the payoff is. Thank you. Rod, what's your take on these issues? Yeah, I, I think similar. I mean, it's the if we think about this aspect of trust in the in the systems, it's as you were suggesting, these distributed ledger systems aren't trustless. You have to trust the code. You have to trust, you have to trust that it works. And, and moreover, in most of these systems, it's interesting to see how even the fully decentralized systems, you know, centralization creeps into them. Christine, it, it, you know, in her talk, suggested to us that there's, you know, that even though it's decentralized, the miners essentially are large mining pools, there's, there's this sort of uh, possibly collusive aspect, which is very non-decentralized. Um, and so generally, you know, we see the centralization moving in. If you think about stablecoin concepts, I mean, stablecoins are designed to eliminate the volatility in, say, something like Bitcoin. It's a cryptocurrency, sort of, but you have human actors that are moving in and tying this to a fiat currency. And so all of a sudden you've got this new trust element. You have to trust these people are actually backing the coin by what they say they're backing it with. Uh, and that can sometimes be in doubt, as is the case with, with, with Tether. So you, you always have this, this trust element. Uh, and, and of course, even in central bank currencies, uh, you know, regular fiat money, uh, you've got a trust issue. And I think what's interesting there though, is that, you know, which form of trust is better? I think it always comes down to, you know, who you should trust, where you should trust people that have the right incentives to do what you want them to do. And so, you know, many of the, the objections against putting your trust in say central bank authorities uh, people raise issues like what's gone on in Venezuela, uh, Zimbabwe, where currencies were inflated to, you know, to become valueless. 
And, but these aren't good examples because these are areas where there, where there was no central bank independence. And so you basically have you know, dictators of countries printing money to fund whatever they wanted to fund. Uh, in a place like the United States, Canada, you have not perfect central bank independence, but reasonable central bank independence. Uh, uh, Mariner Eccles, who was the, the founder of, or, or sorry, not the founder, but was the, the, the board, uh, the chairman of the Board of Governors in the 30s and 40s, uh, referred to the Fed as an agency of Congress. And what that means is that, is that the Federal Reserve is responsible to the people. Uh, it's responsible to the legislative branch. It's not responsible to the executive branch. So it doesn't have to do uh, whatever presidents say, uh, but it is responsible to the people. Uh, and as an agency of the people, its incentives are to do what's good for the public. Uh, and so I think in a context like that, the, the trust is well-founded. Uh, the central bank doesn't gain from, from doing anything that's not in the public interest. Uh, so I think in situations like that, there's lots of reasons to believe that these systems can be, can be preferable to decentralized systems, fully decentralized systems. Uh, that doesn't mean there's not use in these decentralized <laughs> systems. So, I mean, what's the purpose of a stable coin? A stable coin is a digital representation of a dollar that you can trade on a distributed platform. Well, I, I asked and answered the question at the same time. Its use is that it can be traded on a distributed ledger platform. It gives you a new way to transact via currency. And so I do think there is some value uh, in these, but again, there's this whole idea of, of that the, the trust doesn't go away. It's just that in, in, in many instances, you're changing the counterparties you trust or you have to trust in the code. I mean, the trust aspect is always there. Thank you very much. So now it's time for uh, your questions. Yes, Christine. Uh, so, oh. If banks are not... <laughs> If banks are no longer part of the payment system, do we have to regulate them? Um, I would say absolutely, right? Um, because we are in a universe in which money is moving. Uh, there are many different things that can go wrong in a payments um, environment. Uh, one can have, for example, just basic snafus that can take place. For example, someone... Um, is using suboptimal technology uh, so the data can be hacked. Um, one is um, using digital wallets in a way in which um, they are potentially unable to cope with surging demand at certain times. So for example, when people get paid on a Friday that maybe the digital coin doesn't work as smoothly as it should. Um, perhaps a payment is made in error um, and in those situations you need to reverse the transaction. So there are different, in, there are different kinds of risks that would attach even to the private uh, private uh, movement of money. I mean, we see this in the context of money transmitters, for example, that are regulated, even though they're not banks, given the fact that they have responsibilities towards customers, they can uh, defraud them, they can steal that money, they can do all sorts of different things. So one needs to just make sure that these guys have um, the trust element uh, to be able to hold and safeguard, not necessarily hold necessarily, but at least process people's money, that the technology they use is is, is adapted and well interoperable with the larger banking and central banking system. Um, and that they are gonna not cause vulnerabilities for the larger banking environment, um, such that their failure to perform causes folks to lose confidence in the system as a whole. So that, um, you know, the question is an interesting one. One could say that maybe these guys can regulate themselves. You can have some kind of private ordering that can do that. Um, that's not unprecedented. So here in, in the EU, we've had SEPA, the single euro payments area. Um, SEPA has been very much a case of a privately led initiative, initially by the banks, but also non-bank payment providers that have um, come together to create rules, private rules, the road for the scheme. At the same time, there's certain things that they need from a regulatory standpoint, which resulted in the payment services directive in 2000 and whatever, six, seven, um, that allowed these money transmitters to be subject to certain basic standards in order to make sure that we trust them enough to give them the money to process and to create the network effects that that system needs. 
Thank you. Rob, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty extreme scenario that the banks aren't involved in payments. Uh, so I think, you know, we'd be thinking about a situation, I guess, where banks were, were fully dis disintermediated. So, you know, they weren't acting as deposit institutions anymore. They were just pure investment banks, in which case they, they'd be regulated the way uh, uh, investment banks are regulated. So that there would still be issues associated with what they're investing in, uh, consumer protection, uh, financial stability concerns. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty extreme world when the banks aren't involved in payments at all. Thank you. Yes, no. I have two different questions. One is about monetary policy, and then what would become our monetary policy if we have uh, this digital economy. And the other one is close to the risk that you say about networks and maybe cyber war and so on. Maybe as a customer, I will start to change my behavior. I may maybe uh, go to some old fashioned banks. I will pay more fees, but just to keep some uh, usual cash. Or I will stay to have some gold or other things to be sure that uh, it's a hedge against this type of risk. So is it? Well, because if in the US you have forty percent of people that do not have car, but uh, uh, then then maybe we still have, we have a lot of people that will have either old-fashioned uh, bank accounts or gold or whatever. Yeah. Yes, and Rob. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start. So, I mean, one thing I should say is that most of the comments I sort of said earlier really did apply to developed developed countries where a, a large fraction of people are banked. Uh, there was, I was recently visiting the, the Bank for International Settlements and worked on the, the G7 report on, on global stable coins. And, and in that report, uh, it's acknowledged that, that, that you know, that the, the two biggest issues are in payments are one is global uh, international payments issues of making international payments and access. Um, so these are issues that, that that people really need to work on and are working on. But within the context of say developed countries uh, where people are primarily banked, then then you know the, the, the new issues associated with thinking about things like central bank uh, digital currency have, have many monetary policy issues. Uh, so one one thing people talk about is this zero lower bound issue. Uh, that one of the reasons interest rates can't go negative is that then people would convert deposits into cash. Uh, but if you have a digital uh, currency that there's no cash, then you can charge a negative interest rate on the, on the digital cash and it, it allows some more flexibility in monetary policy. Uh, people talk about other aspects such as uh, uh, the fact that you could maybe do monetary policy more precisely uh, because instead of monetary policy working its way through the financial system, you could you could implement it directly with consumers or all of your who are essentially your account holders. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on it is that this is this is actually why uh, the Libra announcement was so important, how, how it had such a big impact, uh, say relative to Bitcoin. Uh, you know, Bitcoin has been around and central banks have been thinking about and talking about Bitcoin for quite a while, but Bitcoin is incredibly small. It's negligible in terms of its size. Uh, and what it means to central bank activity. Uh, seven transactions a second, the SegWit maybe 14 transactions a second per second. Uh, Visa's 20,000, Alipay's 100,000 a second. It's absolutely insignificant. Uh, but Libra, the proposal for Libra, not so much. <laughs> uh, you know, Facebook has billions of customers. So, uh, uh, not billions, but a billion, whatever, customers. So all of a sudden this thing could be massive and uh, equally importantly, it is, uh, it is denominated uh, based on a basket of currencies or backed by a basket of currencies, which means it would be its own unit of account. And so this means that it would essentially be a, a private competing currency with the US dollar, with any currency in any, in any domestic country. And so that impacts the ability to conduct monetary policy. So, so these things can have huge monetary implications if they're large enough. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to um, speak to the behavioral question. Um, the I think it's a great one, and it's one that is on the minds of many folks, which is to say that if we are in a completely digitized world, digitized world maybe people will feel over you know, over surveillanced. Um, they will feel like maybe their money is not safe. If these NatWest type of situations always happen, there's apparently five IT snafus a week in the UK. Um, and so the question is maybe they change their behavior and they move maybe into Bitcoin or they try and find cash where they can do it. 
There is, however, I think a generational situation here, which is to say that the younger generation, the millennials, the Gen Zs, are much more comfortable with an entirely digitized payments environment. I mean, I have students who are transacting almost entirely in Venmo with one another, um, who have no problem giving up their data um, on their phones, who have no problem publicizing what they're spending their money on. And so it seems that digital natives, folks who have never known anything else, um, that maybe they're going to be much more comfortable and that the behavioral shift will be smoother into accepting a very digitized form of payment and in accepting the monetary consequences that might come from it and may feel more natural to them. The other side of it from a developed, developing country perspective is also very interesting, which is to say that many new payment providers have provided services which have never existed before in those countries. So in the case of WePay and Alipay in China, um, they built their own payments networks because banking networks for servicing actual normal citizens just did not exist on that scale. There were no credit cards to speak of. And so they built their own networks. And WePay, I believe, has something like 900 million regular users a month. Um, and in that environment where there's a real local uptake and a need, then in those situations, it's hard to imagine people giving up those gains um, for the trade-offs become much more complicated because they really need those services and no competing services exist. Whereas in the case of here in France or in the, in the UK or in the EU or you know, in the US, we do have fairly developed markets with credit cards and banking systems and so on so that for us, maybe the immediacy and the choice and the existence of uh, options gives us some opportunity to have modulated shifts in behavior. But for certain developing environments in China and in India, for example, after demonetization, digital, the, 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 the anchoring of digital has become much more, uh, much stronger. Um, and so people are much more reluctant to change their behaviors. So, yeah, I have a rather provocative question. How will, uh, would digitized currencies behave in an unsettled world? In other words, how, what's the point of sustainable finance in a non-sustainable world? What, what happens in case of massive conflict? <laughs> I, I did not understand what you said. <laughs> <laughs> what happens in case of massive conflict? Is it, you know, the, the world we live in is clearly bound for the war. And uh, you know, in case of worldwide conflict, what happens to digital currency? You mean there war? Is, like yeah. war? War between China and the U.S. For example, <laughs> what, what would happen? Yeah, well, we we would count the maybe things currencies over, would not be the only problem. Yeah, <laughs> no, but the, the well, indeed, the problem of currency would not be the only problem. But the, the 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 place where my question is leading to is that, from the perspective of uh, people who think of trying to set up a sustainable world. Uh, the sol if there is a solution, it's probably in thinking small and thinking smaller structures. And wouldn't a solution be the setting up of local currencies, albeit digital, but you know, and interacting with one another? But then the question of trust becomes much easier to to take into account. The question of huge energy consumption also becomes. I, I, a lot easier to uh, to take into account. So, the, you know, one thing I have in the back of my mind is, shouldn't we try to think as part of the solution? It's probably not optimal as far as, as huge market is concerned, but as far as the future of the planet is, uh, you know, local currencies, whether it be be they coin money or digital, maybe the one role of central banks could be to actually help the setting up of local currencies and unify them rather than resist them at all costs as it, they could have been seen to be doing before. <laughs> Misha and Rob, would you like to say? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm gonna interpret your, your question basically that, you know, like these are, these are you're, you're talking essentially about flights to safety. And so, you know, we've had many episodes of flights to safety, but the question <coughs> is where, where are you flying from and where are you flying to? And so, you know, in situations where situations like Enron, where we had we had 
you know, fear and corporate debt and so on. We had flights out of corporate debt into the banking. We've had episodes where there's been uh, banking panics where money's either flowed out of banks into treasuries or from one bank to uh, another bank. And then you're positing a situation where we've got sort of just instability in the country as a whole. And so then the question is, where do you, where do you fly to? Yeah. Uh, so people in that case, you know, you can think of, you know, there are many examples of countries that have been in, that have had great domestic instability. Uh, and, you know, people fly into real assets if they can. Uh, they fly into other stable currencies. So, you know, the, the U.S. dollar functions as a reserve currency around the world for partly for this reason. So when other uh, currencies are in trouble or uh, people, you know, try to hold U.S. dollars if they can. So Libra, I mean, in principle, would, would, would play that sort of role. It's meant to be a, a currency that's sort of global and, and would be stable uh, uh, and, and somewhat resistant to, to like whatever type of problems were occurring in any particular country. Now, you mentioned, I, I think you mentioned that the whole world is sort of cr crumbling in some kind of environmental crisis. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, then I don't know. I mean, but you, you fly to something. Would, would people fly into sort of putting faith in local currencies? That's a possibility. And we did have um, a period in which currency was very local. So in the U.S., for example, when the U.S. was founded, every single local region has its own had its own currency. Um, so Massachusetts, for example, small regions in Massachusetts, um, the private banks there would issue their own currency. And that was a very local environment designed to respond to local monetary environments. Unfortunately, that system failed because it was extremely unstable um, and it was difficult to interact and to exchange those currencies without incurring high costs. Um, we know from our own experience that when we travel to say even the UK and you have to exchange for pounds, like that's a pain, right? Like it's, I mean, it's just a pain. And so, um, you know, so the, there are some costs and the ultimate goal of a currency is to create network effects, right? Which is to say that multiple people should be using it, accepting it, merchants should be accepting it. That's when the currency becomes a currency because it functions really effectively as a medium of exchange. That's why Bitcoin really hasn't taken off to the same degree because merchants don't use it. People are not using it. The network effects are limited. So it's much more a sort of nascent, um, bespoke, infinitesimally small system. Um, and so the question becomes whether local environments can generate the network effects that would provide the stability and the safety to function in an environment in which no one trusts each other and when there's a sense of uncertainty and panic and difficulty and surviving into the end of the day, right? Those are, those are real existential issues and so one needs something which we, one can trust completely as accepted widely and everyone can get behind. And so that's the problem with a very localized model. It has failed in the past for that reason. Thank you. Other question? Mathieu. Yeah, I was just wanted to pick up on something you said on when you were talking about uh, CBDC moving there in your first. So you said that if, if we were to implement this, it would probably be through commercial banks. But it seems like CBDC cannot direct competition, right, for, for deposits at least, right? So in some sense, it's bad news for banks. Potentially, it would make their cost of funding higher. Maybe they could, they could also make them more prone to runs because now you have this kind of very safe alternative if you take your money out. So, and so I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit on how, how do you see the role of commercial banks in a world in which you could have retail CBDC available to everyone? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think the answer to that is that that's right. So it's the you know most countries use a two a two tiered system which is based on uh, the provision of uh, central bank reserves to the commercial banks that then create uh, uh, commercial bank money through through the lending process. And that system seems to work pretty well. And so central banks, by and large, aren't looking to destroy that system. Uh, so the idea, I think, in, 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 in principle, and, and the, the deputy governor of the Bank of England, Ben Broadbent, had a speech where, where he, he said that basically if what you would do is you want to make the uh, central bank money as cash-like as possible. So you, you, don't, you don't pay interest on it. You don't offer any of the uh, additional services like overdrafts that would be on, on, on deposits. And in doing so, you, you would limit its competition. So if, if, if all digital cash did was replace physical cash, uh, there would be no disintermediation of commercial bank deposits, uh, commercial banks by reduction in deposits. Uh, so I think that's possible. It's also, it's also you know, 
possible that a little disintermediation wouldn't be a bad thing. If you look at if you look at the United States experience, uh, uh, you know, since since liftoff in, in 2015, the, the, the central bank raised the federal funds rate uh, many times, <laughs> uh, from 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 basically zero up to around three percent in, in several steps, and then back down a little bit. Uh, but but during that time, the, the, that's so that's so this uh, sorry so they raised the interest on excess reserves, which 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 led to a raise in the federal funds rate. But the interest on excess reserves is the rate that commercial banks get paid to hold your money. Uh, so at a time this was close to three this was close to three percent. Com com commercial bank deposits, non jumbo deposits, didn't come up at all. <laughs> so you didn't get any of that as a, as a depositor. So uh, maybe a little disintermediation would be a good thing. But I think the idea would be that this would be done in a way that manages that. Again, if it doesn't pay interest, uh, if it doesn't offer any of the other services associated with commercial bank deposits, then it's possible that all you would all you would do is basically be replacing physical cash. Nisha, would you like to add on this or? I'm good. <laughs> so one last question for Christine. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned the project Jasper. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, why is because I mean, the, so the quick history is that you know the price of Bitcoin went went up to twelve hundred dollars back in 2013, 14, and everybody was like, "What's Bitcoin?" Uh, and so there was a lot of excitement around Bitcoin, and then people started saying, "Well, you know, we don't think Bitcoin is that useful. It's too volatile and all that stuff." But maybe the underlying technology has value. So people started thinking, well, let's think about distributed ledger technology and what it might be useful for. So basically it was exploration. So, I mean, central banks have two reasons for understanding distributed ledger technology. One is they have an obligation in terms of uh, the payment systems. And so they should investigate any new technology to see if it's useful. Uh, they also regulate and supervise the banks. And if the banks are thinking of using this technology, then they need to understand it for those reasons. So partly <coughs> banks were, were doing this to just understand what the benefits might be. So this new technology was there, uh, and so at, at the Bank of Canada, we did this proof of concept where we were looking at the simplest application, which was wholesale payments. So uh, every country in the world has a wholesale payment system that facilitates the payments between banks, just bank to bank payments. And the idea was to do this using a distributed ledger technology. And so what we did was we said, well, what we'll do is, is uh, the banks will essentially uh, allocate reserves to this to this platform uh, the central bank will then create tokens which were, were we call them digital depository receipts so they're, they're they're receipts they're digital assets they're like digital bearer bonds they're assets that are tied to that value that's held by the central bank they were the first stable coins this essentially was a stable coin uh, and then these were moved around in the platform and advantages are that you know the transactions are initiated bilaterally it could operate uh, 24 7 there was this idea that it might be more resilient no single point of failure so there are all these ideas but you know when you actually do it you realize it's actually more complicated because one thing you need is privacy in these payments so uh, a payment from bank a to bank b in the, in the financial system can't be seen by bank c and so when you introduce these type of privacy requirements uh it starts to limit some of these uh potential what were thought of as being potential advantages so in the end it was decided that there were no real advantages uh, in doing wholesale payments on a distributed ledger platform. But I, I, I want to add that we kind of felt that going in, but that we're, but, but this is all was, it's all supposed to be part of a bigger picture, a piece in the puzzle. So the idea is that what we're ultimately thinking is that if you look at it, things like securities clearing and settlement and cross-border payments, where there are a lot of, uh, uh, different parties involved and, and, and costs associated with, with redundancies and reconciliation and all this sort of thing, that, that maybe there would be benefits. Uh, but to get these benefits, say in securities clearing and settlement, you have to have a way to pay. And so that requires this digital, this digital tokenized version of cash. And so, so it was all part of uh, thinking about down the road of bigger pictures and those experiments are still going on. We're looking at other you know, broader applications, but, but that's, it really just started from here's a new technology we should understand it is it beneficial let's let's find out yeah i think the only thing i'd add is that i think regulators as a whole today are under a lot of um, pressure to compete technologically 
um, to offer a technological, more innovative regulatory ecosystem. Now, perhaps nowhere is this clearer than in Asia, where regulators are implementing a variety of different sandboxes um, to encourage innovation and development of new technologies within their jurisdiction. But part of that is also their own regulatory experimentation. Um, and innovations like Libra, for example, which are you know incredibly radical in their proposal. I mean, Facebook has almost two billion dollar, uh, two billion users that um, almost three billion users rather um, that would ev- immediately create a rival to any central bank um, anywhere in the world. So this need to experiment, I think, is becoming immediate and urgent, and regulators are responding to it. The question is really, you know. At what cost? Um, what's the what are the trade offs they're dealing with? How you know they are ultimately the the last resort, the safeguard to safeguard our economic system, our, our wealth, our well being, our economic futures. The experimentation they're under a lot of pressure to implement quickly. How resilient, safe, and workable will they be? Jasper, I think, was a long process of testing and retesting and ensuring that you know this was a real concept, this worked or not. I'm kind of afraid um, that going forward, given the pace of change and the pace of innovation, many regulators may not undertake the same degree of diligence um, in order to meet local consumer demand. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Yesha and Rod, for this uh, wonderful roundtable. I learned a lot from you, so thank you very much.